Hey, I'm Neoma Finn. With all the turmoil going on in Ukraine right now, I wanted to take a moment and highlight the strange and mysterious side of this country. I wanted to take you inside the legends of just a few of their monsters and undiscovered animals. It might help you see the humanity of the country. After all, people are the same everywhere. We all have tales, we all have myths, and we all have stories we tell in the dark. Did you know Ukraine has its own lake monster? It's said to be 30 feet in length, with the head of a serpent and a body like that of a crocodile. It lives deep in the waters of Lake Soman, among the karst caves that make up its bottom. This horrible creature has been seen for over a century near the village of Lukiv, where its groaning and wheezing wail can be heard at night. Pets, such as dogs and cats, that wander down to the lake for a drink often disappear without a trace, supposedly taken as an appetizer for the lake monster. Livestock has been dragged into the lake's murky waters as well. Worst of all, the monster is supposedly responsible for the disappearance of human beings who are out for a walk along the shoreline. News of the serpentine creature first spread outside of the tiny village of Lukiv in the days leading up to World War I. The citizens refused to pay a fishing tax because of their intense fear of the lake and its brutal inhabitant. It ate all the fish, they said, and it would eat any animal or human foolish enough to approach the shoreline as well. When a village leader reported this to Warsaw, the authorities were intrigued and began mounting an expedition to the lake to learn more about its mysterious inhabitant. Unfortunately, with the onset of World War I, the expedition had to be canceled. Later, during World War II, the German government sent a party to explore the lake and determine the existence of the monster crocodilian beast. They scoured the lake, but found nothing. Still, the villagers insisted it was there. It's a claim they continue to make today. Don't go near the lake, they say, or you'll be dragged in and consumed by the monster. It might be strange to think that the German government, in the midst of a world war, would take the time to search for something as apparently mythic as a lake monster. Ah, but the Nazis held a deep-seated fascination with Norse mythology. Their propaganda was full of Norse references, so much so that nearly all Norse mythology was virtually blackballed throughout Europe in the post-World War II days of Reconstruction. Might, then, the Germans have been seeking out something that could be used to advance their image as the new Viking warriors? Perhaps they found the description of this lake monster too similar to that of Jormungandr, the Midgard serpent, not to investigate. Maybe they thought if they found Jormungandr and got him to release his tail, they could induce Ragnarok, the Viking version of the apocalypse. Or maybe there was a team of scientists in Germany who were afraid of winding up on the Eastern Front should they be drafted, and they were desperate for any excuse to continue with their work. Even so, what a valuable resource that would have been. Cautionary tales of the Lake Soman monster persist to this day. One story tells of two young boys who found one hot summer day a little too much to continue their work in the fields. So they slipped away in hopes of finding someplace cool and relaxing to escape the summer heat. They wandered through the countryside talking and laughing and not paying a bit of attention to where they were going until they found themselves on the shore of a lake. The sun beat down on their brows as sweat soaked their shirts and plastered them to their backs. The water glistened with sunlight as a wisp of air danced across its surface. With a single glance, they gleefully plunged into the waters and began to swim out to the deeper center. Finally, one of the boys tired of swimming and stopped to turn and see how far behind him his friend was. But he wasn't there. He spun in the water, searching in every direction, but there was no sign of his friend to be found. He looked back to the distant shore, but his friend wasn't there either. I wonder if he recalled the name of the lake in which he was swimming in those final seconds before he felt his legs clamped in the mouth of the creature and was pulled beneath the surface, never to be seen again. Another, more recent story tells of a young groom who was making merry one day. 
He laughed and danced and celebrated until his head spun from the alcohol and he found he had to lie down for a minute to rest. Within seconds, he was out cold. Nearby, a group of friends were out gathering mushrooms for a meal. They saw the groom lying in the grass and called out to him, but he didn't answer. They realized he'd fallen asleep on the banks of Lake Soman and therefore was in great danger. As they quickly ran down the hillside towards the groom, the monster crawled out of the water and headed right for him. No! Someone screamed. Wake up! cried another. But the groom was too drunk. As the monster drew close, one of the members of the mushroom-picking group fruitlessly hurled his basket of mushrooms at the beast. It fell short. It was no use. They stood by and watched helplessly as the lake monster took the groom in its mouth and carried him back to the water, where it disappeared into its murky depths, already chewing on the poor man's body. No lake monster has ever been captured in Lake Soman, but then no one is brave enough to try. Instead, they all prefer to simply keep their distance, to warn others to stay away, and to do their fishing elsewhere. Please consider a donation of time or money to those organizations helping the people of Ukraine. Following is a list of just a few. These and many other charitable organizations are now accepting donations to help the people of Ukraine. If money isn't an option, please consider a donation of time to these organizations and others. Another Ukrainian monster is described as looking very much like a chupacabra, the southwest version, not the Puerto Rican version. It has a body not unlike a dog's, with no hair and a strange grayish-orange cast to its skin. It has a long tail, much like that of a kangaroo, and hind legs that are much longer than the front. It has been seen around the rural village of Chemer, where it hunts down wild game such as rabbits and feeds on domestic pets and livestock. Not only does it kill its victims, they say it drinks their blood with its long, terrifying fangs. Until 2007, this animal was only a myth. Then hunters shot and killed a strange creature. It was examined by vets who could not identify it as any known species, it appeared to be a strange conglomeration of animals. Each part of its body seemed similar to, but not quite like, another creature from foxes and wolves to otters and martens. It was like all of these, but unlike any of them. Does Ukraine indeed have its own chupacabra? The mystery of the chupacabra began in Puerto Rico back in 1995. There, goats, sheep, and other livestock began to be found with all the blood sucked from their bodies. The name Chupacabra literally means goat sucker. Those unfortunate enough to have seen the monster describe it as a sort of reptilian kangaroo. Since no body matching that description has ever been found, experts postulate that the eyewitnesses were influenced by a Hollywood movie at the time, Species. Those who have lost livestock to the creature find such a theory an insult to their intelligence and will say so to said experts or anyone else willing to listen at any given opportunity. Meanwhile, the legend of the chupacabra began to spread. People in the American Southwest were reporting livestock as being killed by it, while all over Latin America, more and more people claimed to see the fearsome beast. In the Southwest, however, it took on a new form. Now it was something that walked on four legs, was devoid of hair, and looked like a mix of other animals much like the creature in Ukraine. Bodies of this incarnation have been produced for scientific study. Again and again, those bodies have been proven to be coyotes, dogs, or canine hybrids inflicted with mange, thus allowing experts to turn up their noses at any claims of a blood-sucking, livestock-hunting monster. The mange, they say, weakens the animals and makes the possibility of catching wild game impossible, so they go after the domestic animals. I have to admit, though I won't argue with the findings on the bodies produced, I also have never seen a coyote, sick, healthy, or otherwise, that sucked the blood out of its prey and left the body to rot in the sun. Over time, this legend has continued to spread, and now it appears it's reached Europe. But is it a new species? Is it even some strange hybrid? 
Maybe it's the result of unscrupulous scientific research. It wouldn't be the first time. Scientist Ilya Ivanovich Ivanov famously attempted a human-primate hybrid back in the early days of the 20th century. He inseminated three female chimpanzees with human sperm, but failed to produce a pregnancy. Years later, he organized a program to perform the same experiments, this time on female human volunteers, but his plans fell through with the death of his last orangutan. Is the chupacabra just another example of unsavory scientific experimentation let out of the cage? Even if it's a new species, it has spread across the globe in an amazingly short period of time. I guess we really do live in a small planet. If you'd like to help the people of the Ukraine, please consider a donation to charity. Following is a list of just a few who have set up funds. Even more frightening is something that occurred in the 1990s. It began with the body of a man found dead in an elevator. There was nothing to indicate the man had been attacked, no gunshot wounds, no knife wounds, no broken bones, and no bruises except for two small yellowish-blue bruises around a pair of puncture wounds on the man's neck. The body was reported to be an unearthly shade of pale, natural, I suppose, for a dead man. He was brought in for examination where doctors were mystified to discover that he'd died of exsanguination. He'd been drained of his blood. Yet there was no blood at the scene. No pools of it were left under the body. No blood trail indicating the body had been carried or dragged to the spot. No melodramatic single drop running down the cheek from the corner of the dead man's mouth. There was simply no blood anywhere, least of all in the man's body. Nor were there any signs of forced entry into the man's apartment or the tower block itself where the apartment and the elevator were located. How did he lose so much blood without so much as a drop left on the floor beside him? And what were those two puncture wounds on his neck? Could it be a vampire? It wasn't long before rumors began to circulate among the other residents of the tower block. There's a vampire on the loose, was whispered from one person to the next. Lock your doors and windows, became a routine warning. Fear increased daily as panic began to rise. Tensions escalated. Children were kept inside. People rushed from work to their homes and from their homes to the store and back again, intent on being inside with the doors barricaded before the sun slipped behind the horizon. Each creak of a loose floorboard, pop of an old ceiling joist, or gust of wind pressing in on the window panes had old women startling in their seats, old men reaching for knives and clubs, and children hiding under their beds until... One month after the first victim was found, screams emanated from the same tower block, the same elevator. A crowd rushed to that elevator in answer to the cries for help, but it was too late. A 13-year-old girl was found on the floor, her body drained of blood, and strange bluish-yellow puncture wounds on her breast. She was dead. The rumors of a vampire killer on the loose were no longer treated as rumors, those who lived in the vicinity viewed it as fact. This did nothing to relieve the tension or alleviate their fears. No one would use that elevator now. People sought other places to live or went to stay with friends. Those who had nowhere else to turn traveled in pairs, placing faith in the old adage, safety in numbers. The authorities did their best to quell such behavior, but it was useless. Those who lived in the tower block, even those who lived nearby, knew they were being hunted by a vampire, Nosferatu. Desperate to maintain some level of calm, the authorities assigned officers to regularly ride up and down the cursed elevator each day in an effort to prove its safety. It had some little effect on the citizens of the tower block. No one was especially happy to get on the elevator, but if the police were there, well... On one such day, as two officers were riding up and down the elevator, it suddenly became stuck between the fourth and fifth floors. The two men were not concerned. It was an old elevator. These things happened. They were certain it would restart soon, so they radioed the situation to their colleagues and settled in to wait it out. After a few minutes, a sound drew their attention to the ceiling. It was a strange clicking sound, 
that seemed to be coming from a space where a ceiling tile had been dislodged. Their eyes grew in fright as something stuck its brown furry head through the opening. One of the men drew his weapon and prepared to fire, but the other stopped him. Whatever it was seemed to be cowering from the light of the flashlight they trained on the opening. Curious, the man with the flashlight lowered it. To his unbelievable horror, a spider with legs reported to be three feet long crawled through the opening. Stunned beyond comprehension, the man dropped the flashlight, sending it clattering to the floor. The room was immediately bathed in black. Now in its element, the spider descended on the two men, landing on the one who'd held the gun. It began to bite him over and over again as the other man blindly groped in the darkness, searching for the lost flashlight. At last, his hand found it and he sprang to his feet, turning it on and drawing his weapon as he did so. Somehow he managed to get off a shot, not killing the creature, but shooting off its leg and sending it fleeing back into the hole that was its lair. The authorities arrived to find one man in the corner with his gun drawn and his flashlight trained on the dislodged ceiling tile above. The other was lying on the floor, dead from massive blood loss. Next to him was a three-foot-long spider leg. The spider's nest was reportedly found and destroyed, along with the large egg sack, and the whole thing is said to have been covered up by the authorities. The world would know nothing about this if not for a story in a Turkish newspaper. How they found out about it, no one knows. Is it possible for a spider to grow so large? I've heard of several reports of giant spiders right here in the United States. Several stories have come out of Texas of spiders large enough to attack and kill small livestock. But are they true? Who can say? This may have been the most difficult story I've ever written. Spiders terrify me to the point of malfunction. I've never seen arachnophobia, all the way through anyway, nor do I ever intend to. I prefer not to think about spiders attacking humans, either in multitudes or mutated sizes, and perhaps that's what this is, a mutated spider brought on by a certain nuclear disaster not far from the Ukrainian border. I'm Neoma Finn. If you'd like to help the people of Ukraine, please consider a donation to charity. Following is a list of just a few who have set up funds. These and many other charitable organizations are now accepting donations to help the people of Ukraine. If money isn't an option, please consider a donation of time to these organizations and others. If you know of a charitable organization that has set up relief funds for Ukraine that didn't make my list, please feel free to leave its name in the comment section. And finally, please remember the people of Ukraine in your prayers. Thank you.